Good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you've all begun your day uh, bright and busy. And uh, I, I think by now all of us uh, have got used to this virtual meet and greet. But I'm sure uh, we are all missing the real meet and greet and the networking that Nutrition Summit used to provide us a platform every year. Like I said, uh, change is the only permanent thing. I'm hoping that this scenario will change soon for the better. With that positive note, I would like to begin my presentation titled Vitamin D, a classic example of nutrient interplay. All right, uh, when we talk about uh, Vitamin D, a classic example of uh, nutrient interplay, uh, the whole objective of this uh, presentation is to design a product which is uh, scientifically validated and uh, a very credible uh, product that reaches the consumer. To start with, when we talk about nutrient interplay, uh, it's very difficult not to remember our traditional food system. We all know that our traditional uh, food system was based on a fundamental principle of food diversity. And this diversity was not just limited to the cultural diversity in food, but also the diversity that it uh, placed in a thali, in a menu. Uh, one classic example, I'm sure all of us uh, would have uh, read and uh, uh, you know quoted in our uh, in our in our food science papers is uh, the idli and dosa uh, which is uh, which is a combination of uh, rice and lentil and always uh, regarded as the best quality protein when in combination was that the only diversity that uh, the uh, the uh, the traditional food system provided not exactly. Even if you look at uh, the method of cooking, uh, some boiled, some shallow fried, some deep fried, and the combination of uh, rice and sambar, a digestive like a rasam, or you take um, uh, chapati and dal, all this were classic example of a great pairing mechanism, food pairing mechanism. Was this done only to bring in a great taste? Not exactly. The chemistry does enhance the taste of the food, but also increase the bioavailability of nutrients. Moving on. When we are talking about the nutrient interaction, I would simply put it as a friend and a foe model. It's, it's very easy to understand that way. It's very difficult to bring in the entire uh, nutrient concoction into one slide and talk about the various interplay. So what I've done here is selected a few nutrients and I would uh, explain the interplay in each of these nutrients. Let's first look at the positive or the friend aspect. Vitamin C. We all know that vitamin C when Given in combination with iron, it enhances the absorption of iron. There are studies which shows that it enhances absorption uh, close to 70%. Same is the case with copper. Copper enhances uh, absorption of iron. Zinc enhances the bioavailability of uh, folic acid and also regulates the metabolism of uh, vitamin A. On the top portion, vitamin K, vitamin D and calcium, I'm not talking in detail about those uh, um, I mean, nutrients in this particular slide because there is going to be a deep dive with vitamin D. So let's move on to understanding the four, wherein one nutrient is risking the absorption of the other nutrient, which is typically iron risking the absorption of zinc and zinc in turn uh, inhibiting the absorption of copper. Why is this interplay uh, so important? Is this something which is not known? No, all of us 
would have uh, read we are we are very much aware of this interplay but sometime in our urge to innovate this interplay is sidelined is subdued but actually speaking more than in a diet when we are taking nutrients in its purest form that is through a supplement these interplay is much more pronounced what is subdued in a diet becomes more pronounced in a supplement form so now let's look at the vitamin d and its friend and foe model it's it's now over a decade that uh, uh, we we are uh, its vitamin d deficiency has become one of very serious deficiencies uh, nutrient deficiencies uh, nine out of 10 indians suffer from uh, vitamin d deficiency while uh, the symptoms of vitamin d uh, deficiency is not classic or exclusive most of the nutrient deficiencies uh, in a, i mean uh, is seen with certain classic symptoms like fatigue uh, muscle the chronic pain and all these are very common symptoms but we are also aware what kind of a threshold that is what is deficiency state what is an insufficiency state what is a sufficiency state what is a toxicity stage of uh, uh, vitamin d so vitamin d as from a diagnostics uh, side it's very well understood also from life stages uh, it's It's not that uh, vitamin D is a nutrient which has a specific role to play in one particular life stage, and hence it is important uh, for uh, during the growth stage. Not at all. Vitamin D has a role to play across uh, life stages. In fact, the requirement of vitamin D changes according uh, to the life stages, and also according to any kind of disorder that we are facing at a particular time. uh we have most of us i think would have gone through this particular regimen of correcting vitamin d deficiency with a 60000 iu uh, uh for 8 uh, weeks followed by a maintenance dose and retesting so having understood that vitamin d has certain importance and significance let's see how i mean how this plays out in our body vitamin d's role in mobility that is the bone and muscle health is very well understood well documented scientifically proven but there are also a lot of upcoming evidence for vitamin d's role in many lifestyle disorders you take uh, obesity mental health chronic pain diabetes many such disorders have uh, where vitamin d plays a significant role so and yeah how could i forget that i mean in today's scenario we i'm i'm sure most of us would have gone into this regular uh, uh, supplement intake with, with vitamin c vitamin d probably even zinc must have been included in our uh, daily regimen so let's say that uh, we have uh, we have understood vitamin d's importance in uh, in our uh, daily life quite well does it mean that when i'm taking this vitamin d it is uh, my my vitamin d level becomes quite optimum as per the scheduled time period let's say after 8 weeks it becomes uh, optimum or uh, after uh, the maintenance dose it becomes optimum i'm sure most of you even as consumers would have gone through a phase where despite uh, you know, the intake and regular intake of vitamin d there might be Uh, still an insufficiency state seen in your body why does this happen see vitamin d typically has a two way communication um it's not common for uh, most of the nutrients but i'm taking vitamin d as a classic example there is a constant give and take association where vitamin d is playing a central role so if you take uh the cofactors which is on the extreme uh left um magnesium boron and vitamin k they have a role in increasing the absorption maintaining the metabolism increasing the bioavailability and also ensuring optimal functioning of vitamin d vitamin d in turn 
would take care of minerals like calcium, phosphorus, zinc, iron, and few other minerals and ensure that they are optimally functioning. So when we are talking about vitamin D here, it's about 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. This is the target molecule that we need to be uh, deriving or arriving at in a most efficient way. So it is, when, when we talk about 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it becomes more important in the supplement form. Why? Because uh, we, we all know the biological uh, difference in efficiency of D2 and D3. I'm not getting into the debate. I'm not uh, kind of undermining the importance of uh, uh, D2 fortification. It is considering the current regulatory landscape. Something is better than nothing. So uh, D2 is equally important, but D3 is a much more efficient source uh, in uh, getting this target molecule 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. So now in the deep dive, we are first going to be looking at the cofactor magnesium and boron. In fact, magnesium and boron, I would say, is the most underrated, um, unrecognized uh, minerals. Probably magnesium is slowly uh, uh, gaining importance, but boron, not much. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, magnesium uh, deficiency is not very well stated uh, or identified uh, in India, that there is, there is not much data support for magnesium deficiency, is because magnesium is uh, present, is a good, I mean, there are various food sources of uh, magnesium. So we believe that the Indian population may not be uh, magnesium deficient. But is that a very logical conclusion to be questioned? Because lack of data doesn't mean that we are on the positive side. So, I mean, for example, um, in the US, in 2012, there was a research, um, I mean, there, there was a research quoted in 2012 uh, Journal of uh, Nutrition Reviews, wherein almost uh, half of the uh, US population were not consuming enough of magnesium, adequate level of magnesium. This was in the year 2001, 2002. And this was the same year where, when US, um, I mean, saw a greatest spike in the case of type two uh, diabetes. So we really cannot say that lack of data we do not know whether Indian population is deficient in magnesium or not. So it's something that we need more data support. But magnesium's role in vitamin D is very well established. Magnesium is needed for the production and activation of the vitamin D binding uh, protein. And it is also a cofactor uh, for the enzymes that activate vitamin D. If you look at boron, Boron is a, uh, is a uh, mineral which is required for increasing the bioavailability of uh, vitamin D. And also it inhibits the catabolic enzymes which break down 25 hydroxycholecalciferol. In fact, there are studies which shows that non-responders of uh, vitamin uh, D supplementation show an increase in the level of 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol when their supplement is added with boron and magnesium. Such is the importance of these two cofactors. Moving on, vitamin K. This is, I would say, uh, again, a very well-established science and a fairly popular uh, uh, supplement uh, therapy where vitamin D is given in combination with K2. Vitamin D and K2 uh, behave more like uh, twin brothers or twin sisters, where one plus one becomes three. That is, vitamin D is required for the uh, proteins that are dependent on vitamin K, for the production of proteins that are dependent on vitamin K. And what are these proteins? This protein, one of these proteins is the vitamin D binding protein. So there is a... a a complementary role between vitamin K and vitamin D. When they act together, 
uh, the, uh, the way calcium moves into the bone is much more efficient. In fact, it also inhibits the movement of calcium into the artery, that is the calcification of arteries. So there is a dual role. One is the bone and the muscle health, and the second is the cardiovascular health. So vitamin K role on in vitamin D metabolism is a very well-established science. Considering that we have taken all these cofactors and our vitamin D levels are optimal, what does it do? Again, in turn, vitamin D, optimal levels of vitamin D plays in two ways. One, very well known, uh, increasing the absorption of calcium, bone mineralization. And the other less understood part is the iron, manganese and zinc homeostasis. So in fact, uh, by, its, by this particular role, it maintains a very healthy level of hemoglobin, thereby well oxygenated blood, and thereby a very well functioning immune system, just not only by the iron, also by manganese and zinc. So this is a, I've taken very few examples of nutrients and uh, I'm, ex I'm trying to exhibit the, the complexity uh, in which they play and the complementary role of each of these uh, vitamins. So we understand that these uh, nutrient interplay should be very well remembered and uh, you know, it should translate well in, into our products. Does it translate well in our products is a question mark. Now let's see an example of the US market, which is uh, the supplement hub. Probably we take the US market as reference and we bring in a lot of uh, product ideation from the US into India. So how does uh, the US market play out? If you look at the D3 supplement scenario in the US, the most popular category is D3 plus K2, D3 plus calcium. There are some upcoming trends with, uh, on, uh, um, with marketing claims of individual ingredients where D3 and coconut oil, D3 and whole food extract, uh, D3 plus leucine and D3 plus cofactors are seen. Why is it that D3 plus cofactors is not a very popular uh, supplement uh, in the US, which is which ought to be considering the kind, kind of science uh, we have to look at or to refer to. This could be probably because US is a market where standalone supplements are very popular. You have many magnesium supplements. There are also boron supplements available in uh, the US. Uh, so there could, this could be one of the reasons that Specifically, D3 cofactor combinations have not come out, but it's a wait and watch game because already uh, there are products available uh, and uh, which is very well accepted. Commercially has a very good rating uh, for uh, D3 and cofactors. If you compare this with the Indian scenario, we all know it's D3 is either a standalone or D3 calcium probably D3 uh, K2, maximum we can go to is D3 Omega-3. There are not many other cofactor kind of a supplement combinations available in India. Probably we could, uh, we could see that there are many uh, vitamin D3 multi-nutrient, uh, that is multivitamin, multimineral and D3 combinations available. Are these scientifically validated uh, uh, combinations. Um, well, I mean, uh, I'm sure there could be, there, uh, there should be some uh, marketing, uh, you know, there should be a marketing science to it, but <laughs> I'm really not sure how well scientifically validated are these multi-nutrient uh, supplements. See, Nutrient equilibrium is a very, very dynamic. We know it's a very dynamic state. It's, it's, it's not ideal. We can't achieve nutrient e equilibrium uh, just through supplement, uh, supplement programs or supplements. 
uh, or through fortification. There are a lot of factors that play out for nutrient equilibrium. But the least that we could do is that when we are designing products, we need to take into consideration the nutrient interaction, at least the well-established nutrient interaction. And there is a, a great responsibility that we have as uh, industry experts and professionals to bring out scientifically validated products into the market, especially because India is at a very, inf it is, it is, I mean, I'm sure it's an in infancy stage when it come, when it come uh, when we compare it to the global market scenario, the global nutraceutical market scenario. At such an infancy stage, one of the striking challenges in the market is that consumer trust, consumers lack trust in nutraceutical products. So the more scientifically validated products, more scientifically driven innovation, more responsible marketing is definitely going to uh, prove that the, the growth rate that is being projected by most of the market research reports for India is just not a projection, but also would be a reality. So where we are now is not where we will always be. There are brighter days up ahead. This is not only true uh, for the nutraceutical market scenario, but also I believe, I strongly believe this is true for the current situation of COVID. I'm hoping to meet you all soon in person. That's uh, my presentation and uh, if you have any questions for me, please do post it in the Q&A section. Thank you.